Howdy, and welcome to Bamberger Ranch. My name is Roel Lopez. I'm the director of the Texas A&M Natural Resources Institute, and we're going to continue our Leopold Live series here at Bamberger, continuing to talk about the five basic tools introduced by Aldo Leopold, the father of wildlife management. These five tools include cow, axe, plow, a fire and gun and what we hope to do in the upcoming months is show you how those tools can be applied but with very specific projects and objectives and so with me is Dr. April Sampson she's the executive director of Bamberger and she's going to tell us a little bit about Bamberger and what we hope to cover in the series. Great thank you so much Roel we're really excited to have you and your colleagues from the Natural Resources Institute back here at Sela Bamberger Ranch Preserve and we're excited about continuing our journey into Leopold Live version 2. Like Roel said we'll be uh, providing more detail and more useful information regarding the five tools that Aldo Leopold championed. Here at Sela Bamberger Ranch Preserve, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our mission is landowner stewardship, outreach, and environmental education. So we have uh, many Central Texas school children that come visit us every year uh, for hands-on science-based environmental education lessons, and we also lead uh, showcase tours and workshops for landowners interested in practicing restoration and good land stewardship. Um, so we're very happy to be partnering with Natural Resources Institute um, and we hope that we know that you'll benefit a lot from the information that we are going to be um, talking about during this new version of Leopold Live. So let's go ahead and get started. Great. Hi there, I'm Christina Farrell and I'm a biologist out here at the Bamberger Ranch Preserve. And today I'm going to be talking with you about cowbird management. So we are continuing on with our conversation about the wildlife valuation and the different ways that landowners can qualify for that valuation. One of those ways is predator control. So why are cowbirds considered predators and why do we manage for them? So to answer those questions, it is first important to understand the natural history of the species. And as a rule of thumb, no, ma no matter what species you're working with or what type of management you're doing, always a good place to start is with the natural history of that species. Having an understanding of that is gonna help you make more informed, thoughtful management decisions. So in terms of our brown-headed cowbirds, that's the cowbird I'll be talking about today because that's the bird we have in our area. Uh, their natural history is actually quite unique and interesting um, compared to most other songbirds. So historically, this is a bird that would follow around the large herds of American bison that were roaming all across North America. Uh, so this means that our cowbirds were never staying in one place for a very long period of time. And I mentioned this because cowbirds are what we call brood parasites. And that simply means that they do not build their own nest and they do not care for their own young. They will find a host species, the female will lay her egg in that species nest, and that host species will take over all brood care, including incubation and taking care of that young uh, fledgling group that you've got right there. So um, this wasn't historically too big of a problem, however, because our cowbirds were always on the move, no one area was being parasitized too heavily. However, with the settlement of people, so too came the settlement of their livestock. So the cowbirds didn't have those large herds of bison to follow around, but they did have our cattle, our livestock to fill that niche. And you might be tempted to wonder, well, if the cowbirds aren't roaming around North America constantly living that nomadic lifestyle, can they now begin to build their own yes, nests and care for their own young? And to that, you have to pose the question, if you had evolved this highly efficient, highly effective method for reproducing large numbers, what incentive would you have to stop doing that? So that is why it is our job as land managers to make sure that we are properly caring and managing for those cowbird populations. Now, luckily, there are landowners all across Texas that help us with this management program. 
Um, and actually here in the Edwards Plateau, we actually have increased um, numbers of cowbird management. And that is because we have um, some really cool species in our area that are actually threatened and endangered. So respectively, we have the black cat vireo and the golden cheeked warbler. So those two birds are what we call species of greatest conservation need. And that just means that private landowners can help us out with the management of those species. And Texas Parks and Wildlife actually has a no cost training course and certification for managing cowbird populations. Now, because we're dealing with live animals, there are going to be strict protocols in place for how you're managing for cowbirds, just to ensure that these animals are handled safely and responsibly at all times. So with that strict protocol is also going to come consistent data collection. So if you're a landowner managing for brown-headed cowbirds, there's going to be a few different things that you'll always need to be collecting data on. The first one is going to be the dates that you're trapping. Any day that you are actively trapping for cowbirds, always making sure that you're documenting that date. Secondly, we need to know the numbers that you're collecting. So how many cowbirds are coming into your trap, as well as uh, the breakdown on sex there. How many males do we see? How many females do you see? Luckily, this is a sexually dimorphic species. Very easy to tell the difference between the males and the females. The female is going to be overall very drab and gray, whereas the male is going to be a bit more showy, have a kind of a pretty brown head, black body. So taking the numbers on your males and females should be very easy. You're also going to want to keep track of how many non-target birds, if any, are ending up in your trap. Birds are inherently interested in cattle because they're attracting insects. So you might find some other birds interested in the trap, in the food in the trap, in the water. So just being sure to document any non-target species that end up in your trap. And then lastly, uh, should you be so lucky to find a banded bird in your trap, you'll of course want to document that. And I will briefly mention that should you find a banded brown-headed cowbird in your trap, you will still need to let that bird go. Uh, but just be sure to document that unique nine-digit nine digit band code on that bird. And we'll be sure to give you guys the link to where you can document that. That is through the USGS Bird Banding Lab. And just as a rule of thumb, no matter what you're doing, should you ever encounter a banded bird, that is a great resource where you can document that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the trap that we have here on the ranch. So this is what we call a portable metal trap, and it works really well for our management here on the ranch, but there are different types. And of course, Texas Parks and Wildlife has provided some really detailed sources on the different types of traps, as well as how you can construct them yourself. So uh, they're all gonna operate similarly, and they're all gonna have kind of the same sort of location requirements and sort of operational functions to them. So we'll go over those now. So our trap that we have right here is a good example of location. So there, there, there's a few things that I keep in mind whenever I'm looking for a nice location for my cowbird trap. Number one, kind of obvious, I wanna be close to livestock because that's what's first gonna get your cowbirds in the area is having cattle or some sort of livestock to where they're already interested in the area. So that's always gonna be step one if you can. Now, step two is gonna be having a nice open area, a grassland. That's another thing that's gonna bring cowbirds into the area. And just making sure you're not in a heavily forested, dense canopy type area. So we do have some trees behind us. Those actually provide a little shade for the trap, which is nice, but they're not completely surrounding the trap at all. Now, the thing I like most about this trap location is how accessible it is. I've got a road right here in front of me, just means that at all times people can be driving by, checking on the trap, but no matter where you decide to place your trap, just making sure it's somewhere that's easy for you to access and get to every single day. And then the last thing that I like about our trap is that, you know, not, not even do we have it on, you know, level ground, we have it on very level ground. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I like that, but just whenever you're placing your trap, making sure it's in a nice flat, you know, grassland, you don't have to have concrete under it. That is a nice feature, but just making sure that the ground is level. You're not in a rocky area or in a sloped area that you've got a nice flat surface for your trap. Now let's talk a little bit about when this trap is operational, whenever it's peak songbird nesting time and we've got this thing going. 
So there's gonna be a few features that your trap has to have. Number one, I need food in it at all times and water in it at all times. And be sure to keep those two separate. And one more note, you know, if you're starting your day with a few cowbirds and you've got a little bit of water, a little bit of food, make sure that you're thinking about how many birds you think you might get and that you have plenty of water for increased number and food as well. And then something else to keep in mind is that you want shade on your trap. You know, we're not going to be banding in, or we're not going to be trapping in um, winter. So think about that spring sun, that winter sun, making sure you've got a nice amount of shade on top of your trap so that those cowbirds have the option of sun or shade, giving them that option. Now, speaking of weather, um, something else that you'll always want to keep an eye on is the forecast. Um, if you see inclement rain or wind in the forecast, go ahead and do not operate the traps on those days. So a little bit of rain or wind might not seem like a big deal to you or me, but to a, cow to a cowbird in a foreign environment, during an inclement weather event, we really want to make sure that we're just not operating if there's any sort of foul weather on those days. Now, talking a little bit more about when your trap is operational, if you're looking to attract a lot of cowbirds, the best way to do that is to have a good number of cowbirds in the trap. So if you're starting your trap with one bird, you're likely to either not attract many, if any, um, so it's really best to start your trap with 10, even 15 birds if you can. This is a gregarious species, so if they see that there are already birds in here, they're going to be curious, they're social, they're going to want to come into the trap. So having a fair starting number of birds is really going to help you out with your trapping. Now, whenever it comes time to catch the birds in your trap, getting them out of the trap, I would recommend using a dip net or a scoop net. And depending on the handle of that net, you can operate it from outside of the trap, but you're also welcome to go into the trap. That might help you actually uh, catch the birds that way. Now, once you've got your birds and it comes time to dispatch or euthanize them, uh, the way that you're going to be doing this is through cervical dislocation. That's the way that we recommend you do it. That's the way that Texas Parks and Wildlife recommends you do it. So that's the safest way, the best way to euthanize your birds. And on that same note, because that's how we want our birds to be euthanized, we want to think about predators because we don't want any of our birds to meet their end that way. We want to make sure that we're handling that end of things. So thinking about predators, um, I'll mention that I like my concrete here because that means I'm not going to have any raccoons or mammals, any skunks that can dig under. They won't have access to the trap that way. So be thinking about your location, thinking about how stable it is on the ground, think about any mammals, how could they get into the trap that way. Another thing that I like about uh, keeping this safe for predators is that the grass is really low around my trap. That's going to help me keep an eye out for snakes. Uh, you might not think about snakes, but remember that any reptile, mammal, or bird that eats birds will be attracted to the trap. So I like my short grass out here. I like the concrete so that no one can do any digging. And one more thing I'll mention is to Keep an eye out for, whenever you're placing your trap, any active fire ant mounds that might not seem intuitive to think of them as a predator, but they could be attracted to the trap if they're in the area. So just making sure that there aren't any fire ants in the area is going to be really helpful. All right, so I think we'll just talk now about when it comes time to shut down your traps. So whenever the trap is not operational, um, even if you're changing its location, if you're taking it to your barn or shed, putting it somewhere else, still important to make sure that the trap is properly shut down. And that simply means making sure that your entrances are completely sealed to the trap. That's why I've got this board right here. Whenever the trap is sealed, I've got that board on top. There's absolutely no way that any cowbirds or any other birds can get into that trap. And if you weren't going to do that, you could also just make sure that the trap was completely sealed open, meaning that this door would be nice and wide open. So you can do it either way, completely shut or completely open, up to you, but just make sure that there's, you know, without a shed of a doubt, that can be safe. And remember your trapping dates. So if you're uh, taking part in cowbird management, that means that you're going to be operating from March 1st until May 31st. Those are your operational dates, and the trap shouldn't be working any other days other than those dates. All right, so this is a pretty quick rundown on why we trap for cowbirds, how we trap for cowbirds, and how we do it safely. 
Uh, so there's a lot more information out there, but if you are a landowner and you think that your area could benefit from cowbird management, it is definitely a technique to consider. All right, so now we're gonna take a moment to answer a few questions. And just remember, if you're watching our video right now, feel free to drop any questions for us in the chat. Uh, so Christina, if I find a bird that looks kind of unhealthy in my trap, what do you recommend doing with it? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, anytime you see a species where you think disease might be of concern, uh, incineration is always going to be your safest bet because um, that's really going to ensure that no other species is going to, you know, come in contact with that bird uh, in any sort of way. So that's always going to be the, the safest way, you know, to give you peace of mind and make sure that no disease is spreading and to make sure that that's completely wiped out. Awesome. Uh so if I find any non-target species in my trap, should I record that as in keeping part of my records? Yes, so absolutely. And um, you know, other non-target birds are likely to be attracted to the trap, so always keep an eye out for that. And yes, uh, if you find them, before releasing them, uh, you know, go ahead and document what species, how many, um, and you know, be sure to ID that bird if you can. And just whenever you're submitting your annual report, um, more data is always going to be better. So yes, just keeping that in your own records and submitting it for your reports, that's always going to be helpful. Great. And how many traps do you recommend be placed for per acre on a property? Or what kind of trap density do y'all operate here? Yeah, so I'll speak more to the latter of that question and tell you that here on the ranch, we have two cowbird traps and we are 5,500 acres. So, you know, thinking about acreage per traps, that's, you know, kind of skewed there. But really only operating two traps means that we can definitely check them every day. We don't have too many traps that we're worried about making sure that they're safe and operational. Having fewer allows us to make sure that those are operating perfectly at all times and they're very safe traps. So I would always err on the side of comfort. Having fewer is better because it means that you can keep a better eye on them. So I, I can't answer to exactly how many acres should you have, but I, was, I would just always err on the side of have as many as you are comfortable management to the absolute best of, of your abilities. All right, well, that was pretty exciting. Sure Thank you for, for joining our session of Leopold Live. Uh, again, uh, we'd like to thank all those uh, speakers and those that participated with our session. Uh, look for upcoming sessions over the course of the next year. And our, per our hope is to cover these very specific topics that are of interest to landowners and natural resource managers. That's right. And I'd like to thank once again the Natural Resources Institute for coming out here and helping us provide this valuable information. Um, at Bamberger Ranch Preserve, we hope to have our programming, including our workshops and tours, uh, back up and running by the fall, depending on how things go. Uh, so make sure to wa watch for both the Texas A&M Natural Resources Institute and Bamberger Ranch Preserve on your social media channels. And make sure to uh, check in every once in a while and see what we're up to.